So hello uh, and welcome. Uh, my name is Nicole Hall. Uh, I'm here at the EHESS with Jérôme Dokic. Um, I will moderate his uh, session on uh, on the sublime. Uh, so I'm I'm a philosopher too. I've worked on the idea of uh, aesthetic experience um, and on environmental aesthetics in particular. And I met Jérôme a number of years ago when I uh, came. Uh, to Paris as a postdoc uh, to do some research on aesthetic experience and cognitive science and the interface between those two. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Jérôme, who is uh, a philosopher, really a philosopher of mind, who has a strong interest in the cognitive sciences. Um, and uh, he's uh, what they call a directeur d'études here at the EHESS, uh, which is uh, the equivalent of a professor, right? A university professor. Um, and he's been here since 2004. He's a member of the Institut jean Nico, who uh, wrote his thesis at Geneva, at the University of Geneva under the direction of Kevin Mulligan. Um, in any case, uh, Jérôme has written extensively on perceptual experience, um, uh, so in the philosophy of mind, auditory experience, and uh, recently launched uh, a project a couple of years ago on the concept of uh, the sublime. Um, so with that, uh, Jérôme, if you want to start. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Nicole, for this uh, introduction. Thanks to Morena and Jacquino uh, behind the screens to make this possible. So. So yes, I'm going to uh, talk uh, about the sublime, as Nicole said. So let me launch uh, my presentation. So yes, I, I think, but maybe we, sorry. So, I see the sublime, or more precisely, maybe our experiences of the sublime, as a, a good example of what may be called an interdisciplinary uh, object. I won't say much about this now, maybe we can talk about that uh, later on. Uh, the idea is simply that I think that the sublime, or more precisely, uh, our conscious uh, experiences uh, when we face something uh, sublime uh, is, a, is a complex, if you wish, multi-faceted uh, object, multi-leveled object, which needs uh, you know, coordinated research uh, involving philosophy, but also social science and cognitive science. Uh, I'm not a, an expert on aesthetics, actually. I don't consider myself to be such an expert. Uh, uh, Nicole, uh, 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 is, is one expert on aesthetics, but I, I've been involved in um, um, the, the, the aesthetical, uh, philosophical aesthetics, sorry, uh, through a project uh, founded by the French um, research uh, agency, a project which involved, as you can see on the, on the, on the screen, uh, the three research uh, units, so my own unit, which is Institut jean Nico mainly uh, philosophy uh, units, uh, social science and philosophy, and, and cognitive science. Uh, we have another research unit from the OHSS, uh, CRAL, Centre de Recherche sur les Arts et le Langage, and uh, 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 colleagues, uh, psychologists and neuroscientists at Université Paris-Cité. So I'm directing this project, which is about the sublime, and more precisely about the the effect or the implications of our experiences of the sublime on self-awareness, on our uh, perception and also conception of one oneself. So I won't be too long here to uh, leave room for discussion, but um, my, my, my uh, talk today, my presentation will be uh, in three uh, parts. So I will just say something about uh, the experience of the sublime its core uh, features. Then I will put forward very schematically here, of course, uh, an analysis uh, from a philosophical point of view of this experience of the sublime. 
and I will end uh, with uh, some uh, indications and, and prospects. So as I know, I mean, uh, many uh, non-philosophers are probably attending this uh, session, so let me say something very briefly uh, uh, from, from a historical point of view. So we can start with uh, an influential treatise on the sublime, Peri Upsos, uh, attributed to Longinus, which um, actually the treatise is about uh, elevated language. So it's about uh, the power of re rhetoric, but it emphasizes in, in general our natural preferences for uh, vast things. I mean, uncommonly vast uh, objects or scenes or situations. So Longinus uh, uh, wrote, I quote, the impulse of nature inclines us to admire not the, the little clear transparent uh, uh, rivulet that ministers to our necessities, but the Nile, uh, the, the Easter, the Rhine, and or still much more the, the ocean. So as you can see, uh, there is a contrast between, uh, you know, uh, relatively small uh, things, small rivers, small fires, and uh, vast uh, things, including uh, the ocean or celestial files, uh, as the Longinus uh, puts it uh, here. And much later, in the 18th uh, century, the Anglo-Irish uh, philosopher Edmund Burke uh, discusses the same contrast, actually, as Longinus, uh, in terms of a distinction between uh, the sublime in uh, red here and the uh, beautiful in green. So Burke, I quote, uh, uh, wrote, uh, for sublime objects are vast in their dimensions, beautiful ones comparatively small, beauty should be smooth and polished, great, rugged and negligent, rugged and negligent. beauty should not be obscure, the great ought to be dark and gloomy, beauty should be light and delicate, the great ought to be solid and massive. Uh, and uh, Burke, I will come back to, to that, uh, describes the sublime, our experience of the sublime, as the strongest of our passions, the emotions, if you wish. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's a strong experience that we have uh, with uh, respect to uh, mostly uh, nature and natural uh, scenes or, or objects. Finally, probably the most sophisticated uh, account of the sublime is to be found, of course, in Kant, uh, who was inspired by Burke, but, but you know, put forward a, a quite different account of uh, the sublime, uh, not only in this work, uh, preliminary work, but uh, especially in the critique of judgment uh, and of the uh, 18th century. So, uh, as you can see, there's also a distinction here, a contrast between uh, what, what Kant uh, calls the feeling of the sublime and uh, beautiful. Again, feeling of sublime uh, uh, corresponds to things in red here on this slide, whereas uh, the feeling of the beautiful corresponds to uh, so. Between the words on the on the slides, so maybe I won't read the, the slide. So, as you can see, I mean Kant uses mainly examples from nature, from natural things, but with a few exceptions. For instance, uh, of course, we have uh, Homer's uh, portrayal of the, the girdle of Venus, but also Milton's portrayal of the, of the infernal kingdom in the Paradise uh, Lost. So some some arts of so works of art, sorry, are also, I mean, um, included in uh, Kant's examples of uh, the sublime. Now, from a contemporary point of view, we, we can individuate uh, the experience of the sublime uh, within uh, our conscious experience, uh, and in particular within our aesthetic experiences. We can say that the experiences of the sublime are triggered by vastness. So we develop a little bit each of these features. Uh, they are emotionally complex. They are mixed feelings, as, as we shall see. They are overwhelming. They overwhelm the mind in some sense to be uh, made uh, precise. 
they are rare, so they are extra extraordinary experiences, but still they have sometimes at least a transformative dimension. They transform us in some sense. Fifth, and they, they are uh, perhaps it is more controversial, but they are solitary experiences, but still socially relevant in a way uh, which I will briefly explain. And finally, they are uh, frameless uh, in contrast, as we will see, uh, perhaps experiences of the beautiful. So let me elaborate uh, briefly on each of these uh, features. So vastness, vastness actually is a useful concept to, to, to cover many dimensions, uh, allowing for uh, extreme values uh, like space and time, um, power, force, and complexity, authority, and maybe other features, other dimensions uh, can uh, allow for uh, extreme uh, values that, uh, that uh, may be uh, described as sublime in some circumstances. So vastness, if you wish, is not necessarily natural vastness, although, of course, nature might be a primary source of uh, sublime things and uh, situations. For instance, here, administration Sandra Magnus is a NASA, uh, was a NASA astronaut. And, uh, she, she said, I quote, the vastness, vastness of space is truly evident as you watch the Earth turn slowly beneath. It is all inspiring and overwhelming all at once. Okay, so that's the vastness here uh, in uh, spatial dimension. Not to say that everything which is experienced as vast is experienced as sublime, uh, but vastness is certainly, uh, you know, the, one of the core features of sublime objects as the trigger for a certain kind of uh, experience in us. Emotional complexity, of course, is a, is a defining feature of the sublime, probably, of, of our experiences of the sublime. There are mixed feelings. On the one hand, I mean, the sublime triggers negative emotions, and that's very important uh, to understand the sublime in contrast to the beautiful baby. So on the one hand, the sublime triggers uh, negative emotions such as fear, maybe pain in Burke, anxiety or uncertainty. But on the other hand, experiences of the sublime have a positive overall valence. I mean, they, you know, it's an aesthetic experience. So I mean, uh, we, we seek for uh, experiencing the, the, the sublime. Uh, this is something we, we like to experience, uh, despite of the negative components that uh, experiences of the sublime have in us. So, to, I mean, Burke, for instance, used uh, the phrase delightful horror to characterize the, the sublime or experiences of the sublime. And Kant talks of a pleasure which is possible only by means of a displeasure. So to come back to uh, you know the, the Earth, uh, so it can be overwhelming to see the Earth as a globe, uh, as a mere object uh, within the seemingly infinite universe. So that's something discomforting because, of course, uh, it makes us very very small, humble, perhaps much less significant. That's the negative component, and we'll come back to that. But still, it's all inspiring. So we're uh, filled with uh, some kind of positive uh, value when we face the sublime, at least if the experience of the sublime is considered to be an aesthetic uh, experience along with the experience of the beautiful. Overwhelmingness, of course, that's a feature which has, which has been noted by, by many most philosophers interested in the sublime. Uh, experiences of I mean, the sublime uh, saturates uh, our cognitive capacities because we feel that we can't cope with what we uh, experience. Uh, we are losing uh, our cognitive uh, foothold on uh, when we experience the sublime. For instance, Addison, I mean, the 19th century uh, philosopher said, I quote, our imagination loves to be filled with an object or to grasp at anything that is too big for its capacity. So the capacity of imagination, the capacity of perception as well, uh, can, can barely cope with uh, the infinite universe, for instance, or the infinite ocean, seemingly infinite ocean, and so on and so forth. 
And Burks said uh, the same vein that I quote, infinity as a tendency to fill the mind. Okay, so infinity as an overwhelming uh, effect uh, on our uh, mind. As I said, I mean, experiences of the sublime are not ordinary experiences. They are extra extraordinary experiences, uh, and they are rare, uh, even within the class of aesthetic experiences. However, they are, or can be at least, transformative. Maybe we can come back to this uh, during the discussion. But they, they can have deep implications on one's subsequent experiences and uh, life. So they can cause deep changes that affect our system of preferences and uh, values, for instance. Solitary but socially relevant. I mean, expensive supply now, solitary. That may be controversial, but it seems there are no shared or joint expenses of the sublime. Of course, we can be, uh, you know, we can see uh, the Alps. I can see the Alps with a friend, and both of us can have experiences of the sublime. But I mean, why we have this experience, we're, we're alone uh, in front of, uh, you know, uh, nature. Uh, and uh, it doesn't seem that there can be joint expenses of the sublime. Unlike maybe, but I mean, that can, of course, is. Uh, that should be argued for, and like experiences of beauty, which perhaps can be shared. Still, experiences of the sublime enhance well-being and have whole social consequences. And I will say something about that at the end of my presentation. Whole social consequence, meaning that uh, maybe those who have had a, a strong experience of the sublime uh, might, might uh, might have uh, different preferences and values and might take care more uh, about uh, others as, as social psychology was documented. Frameless, so experiences of sublime are, are frameless. So I take this expression, both this uh, phrase from uh, Emily Brady, in the important book on uh, sublime. This means that, you know, the, oh, when you have representations of the sublime, for instance, paintings. Okay. So Caspar David Friedrich, uh, David Friedrich is probably uh, well known as, as the painter of the sublime. That's a representation of a sublime natural scene. Okay. But that representation as a painting is framed, of course. It's, it, it, it is bounded or, or contained. It has a form as a painting. Uh, while, while, uh, while, while the sublime itself is frameless, it's uh, formless or limitless, as Brady puts it. So maybe we can represent the sublime, but representation of the sublime are not themselves a sublime. And of course, a stronger view would be that uh, it's not even possible to represent the sublime as such. So let me say something about an, analyse, an analysis of experiences of the sublime that uh, my colleague Margarita Arcangeli and, and myself, uh, the main philosophers involved uh, in the project um, I talked to you about earlier, uh, have developed uh, in order to test I mean, not, not, uh, not the whole analysis, but some aspects of the analysis uh, experiment. So first, we used the notion of limit experience to uh, characterize, uh, if you wish, the starting points of the experience of the sublime. And in particular, we analyzed uh, overwhelmingness, also one of these core features of the sublime, of the sublime, by means of the notion of the limit experience. Here, the idea, of course, I can't develop this uh, as much as I should and as I, as I wish. Uh, but the, the, the idea is that when we are uh, confronted with something sublime, the ocean, the Alps, or maybe a, a mathematical uh, uh, theory or a physical uh, model, and so on and so forth, uh, we feel that we have reached the limits of our ordinary ways of dealing and coping with the world. So that's the overwhelming. Overwhelmingness is cognitive overwhelmingness. Okay? So we are cognitively saturated which means that uh, our ordinary ways, cognitive ways of understanding the world uh, is at a loss. We can't really deal with what we experience. 
So the sublime is experienced as cognitively incommensurable. So we insist on, on these uh, uh, important components of the expense of the sublime, uh, namely uh, a radical limit uh, experience. And in general, limit experiences, for instance, if you, I don't know, if you try to hear a, a sound which is very, very high, too high for you, because uh, almost a, a, an ultrasound, uh, then of course you feel you have reached the limits of your auditory experience. Okay, so that's a limit experience. In the case of the sublime, it's a global limit experience. So we feel that we are not, uh, we are not powered or gifted enough to uh, deal with what we experience. And that as a negative valence. And that, according to our analysis, explains the negative components of experiences of the sublime, the displeasure by means of which uh, we can have aesthetic pleasure about the, the sublime. And the radical limit experiences involved in experiences of the sublime give rise to uh, feelings of self-negation. We are too small, too insignificant, too humble to, uh, in, in, in front of the sublime. And it seems to us that we can't find comfort in any other cognitive confidence that would allow us to deal with the world. And th this idea that the sublime is associated with uh, a sense of small self, if you wish, the fact that you feel diminished in some sense, maybe in a literal sense, maybe in a more metaphorical sense, um, is at least um, compatible with uh, the rare neurophysiological studies about the sublime. Uh, here, it, it's a study by Ishizu and Sunir Zeki. Uh, Zeki is, a, is an important neuroscientist who uh, is one of the few to have studied experimentally uh, the expense of the sublime. And he found, I mean, these authors found an interesting uh, difference between the way some regions of the brain, which are, which are um, correlated to um, self-reference or self-relevance. Uh, so this uh, study seems to indicate that in the case of the sublime, um, there's what the authors call a suppression of self-awareness. So that's very close to what the philosophers call uh, feelings of self-negation. So we feel small, we feel... Uh, the regions that are supposed to account for our self, uh, for self awareness, what we now call actually the default mode network, but I don't, can't go into details here, are uh, hypoactive in the case of the experience of the sublime, and maybe hyperactive in the case of the experience of the, of the beautiful. Now, of course, when you have uh, an experience, an emotion with a negative valence, for instance, fear, so I fear the dog that is barking at me, uh, the, the emotion is associated with uh, uh, what the psychologists call an action tendency. It tends to, to act on the object to you know, uh, eliminate or attenuate the threat. Okay? So in the case of fear, you want to run away, you know, want to have a, enough distance uh, between us and the dog, for instance, the barking dog. Uh, in the case of radical limit experiences, which are, uh, which have a negative valence, which feel bad uh, in an important sense, uh, of course we want to, to stop this, but in this case we don't really know what to do. I mean, we are at a loss uh, as the, the strategies that needs to be pursued in order to um, uh, to cope with that negative uh, uh, component. So radical limit experiences, we might say, call for uh, accommodation. So an accommodation is a Piagetian notion that we borrow from, from uh, Piaget, but also from uh, recent uh, uses of that notion. So Piaget used to distinguish between assimilation and accommodation. Assimil when, when you have a novel experience, you can assimilate it if you have the appropriate mental scheme, Mental schemas, for instance, to, to deal with what your experience is, with well, what you're experiencing. But if it's too novel or too radical, then, then you need to uh, adjust. You need to uh, uh, change your mental models. Uh, and that requires a creative use of the imagination and thought. Uh, 
you have to uh, create new categories if you wish. For instance, you might need uh, a mental model uh, for, for infinity, mathematical model uh, enabling you to make sense of, uh, of infinity, in the case, for instance, of, of the mathematical uh, sublime. And this distinction between assimilation and accommodation is, it has been used by, by uh, uh, two psychologists, uh, Keltner and Aids, uh, to uh, account for uh, O. So O is this emotional, emotional construct, uh, which uh, is very close to, to the expense of the sublime. It, it's a more general concept, I think. Uh, but as you can see here, uh, they define uh, O by two features here. I don't know if people can see my. Uh, okay, so you see, the vastness means actually experience of vastness, and accom means need for accommodation. So you need to accommodate what you experience when you experience something which is too vast for your cognitive capacities. And as you can see here, that's a table from from their, their paper. But here, what I have circled in red are the kind of uh, what they call physical elicitors, I mean, the, the physical things in the world that can trigger, or as you can see, it's very close to what the philosophers uh, describe as uh, sublime objects. It can be, of course, natural objects. It can be yeah, all inspiring music, but also uh, uh, architectural I mean, buildings, cathedrals, and so on and so forth and also uh, intellectual uh, objects, uh, grand uh, theories, general relativity, and so on and so forth. And all these objects are, you know, meet the criteria for uh, figuring O, oh, namely experience of vastness. Here, of course, it's abstract vastness, it's mathematical vastness, and uh, conceptual vastness, and here it's the need for accommodation. So uh, I need to change my view of the world to deal with what uh, I'm uh, thinking of, for instance. In the case of the expense of the sublime, so uh, we think that expense of the sublime involves O oh, in the analysis by Keltner and Heitz, but also a special way of accommodating radical limit experiences. And what we may call aesthetic accommodation, and that's just end waving because I can't say much more about that. But what, what we may call aesthetic accommodation is what differentiates expenses of the sublime from other cases of O, including uh, religious and mystical O. So what we have is something like that. We have a radical limit experience. We, we feel that we've reached the limit of our cognitive capacities. That creates a need for accommodation. If we don't accommodate, okay, so we feel very small, we have a feeling of self-negation, but then we disappear from the world. As Freud uh, used to say, we fall from the world or something like that, from the edge of the world. So that's, uh, that would be a condition called uh, depersonalization or derealization. We, we don't find uh, an appropriate place uh, in the world if we don't accommodate. If we accommodate, we can accommodate in various uh, ways, but the aesthetic way of accommodating uh, the radical limit experiences is what we call the experience of uh, the subject. So not only the need for accommodation, but also a specific way of accommodating. So to sum up, I mean, this uh, second part of my presentation, uh, we, uh, in our paper, the paper that, that is mentioned here at the end, uh, the bottom of the slide with my data, uh, so we have uh, four components. So it's not a linear, uh, sequence or process, I mean, and you can have various uh, feedback uh, loops, for instance, but then these are different moments, if you wish, of the experience of the sublime, which is, according to us, essentially a, a, a dynamical experience, it's something that takes time. Uh, so there's an assimilation failure. So, so our current mental models uh, of the world are insufficient to deal with what we are experiences. That's too big, too powerful, uh, too complex, uh, too different from us, uh, and we, we don't know what to do with that. We have a metacognitive awareness, that is, we are aware that something that is wrong with our current cognitive capacities, that creates a feeling of self-negation. 
that's a small self-effect that philosophers and psychologists have noted uh, in relation to uh, sublime. It feels small. Uh, and then there is aesthetic accommodation, that is, we, we rise to the level of the sublime, if you wish, or maybe above, uh, according to Kant, but at least to the level of the sublime, that is, we accommodate, we find new ways of dealing with experiences. For instance, we mobilize the notion of infinity, or we, in Kant, we realize that uh, our mind is uh, actually uh, uh, powerful enough to, to encompass what, uh, from a rational point of view at least, uh, where perception, imagination, and the ordinary thoughts uh, fail us, uh, we still have reason for Kant, and uh, not a Kantian, so I don't want to defend that particular explanation of aesthetic accommodation, but for Kant, uh, it's, it's a way of uh, rising above, if you wish, at least to the level, and maybe above the level of uh, the sublime object. And the three components are what we call the radical limit experience. We feel metacognitively. Metacognition is cognition about one's own cognition. So in, in this particular case, we, we feel that we have, uh, we have, we have reached the limits of, um, of um, ordinary or spontaneous ways of coping with the world. Okay, so let me, uh, for 10 minutes or so, um, perhaps talk about some implications and, and prospects of uh, the uh, analysis that I sketched in the second part. Uh, first, uh, many philosophers, I think, tend to insist on uh, the fact that the sublime uh, constitutes a, a physical threat, if you wish, to oneself. So, uh, of course, Burke uh, insists on uh, um, the, the, the idea that the sublime gives rise to a sense of physical vulnerability. We feel physically vulnerable uh, because, according to Burke, the experience of the sublime is associated with fear, primitive fear, of pain. Uh, so there's a storm, uh, a strong. Uh, Every storm uh, that we experience, experiencing, we, we are afraid. Maybe we are safe. We are behind the window, solid, strong house. Uh, but still, I mean, we we feel that we are, we are physically vulnerable um, when confronted to these uh, feats of nature. Uh, and of course, that's an important uh, class of sublime experiences. But in our analysis, we insist more on the sense of cognitive vulnerability, which is, of course, it can be associated with physical vulnerability. Um, but cognitive vulnerability is more important uh, for us than uh, physical uh, vulnerability, if you wish, uh, which gave us some freedom you know, to uh, analyze uh, sublime objects that are not clearly physically threatening like music, for instance, sublime music, uh, or other kinds of works uh, of art. So works of art can make us feel cognitively vulnerable, vulnerable, vulnerable even if um, maybe our experiences of them are uh, reasonably safe. So maybe that's a you know, a point of disagreement with uh, Emily Brady and perhaps uh, Nicole, maybe, I don't know if we're going to talk about that, but uh, some people have uh, argued that um, the sublime is, you know, is only or, or mainly the natural sublime, and that works of art are not really sublime or sublime by, by extension, if you wish. So that's a view that we try to uh, pose. Uh, of course, I can't, I can't go into, into many details here, but uh, we think that works of art and part of the project was about music, actually. Uh, so for instance, we have uh, Esteban Bourg, my colleague at UHSS, who is a musicologist, uh, historian and sociologist of music. Uh, and it was important for us to, um, 
try to identify you know the sublimity in music uh, without necessarily leaning on the hypothesis that music itself is uh, physically noise music or music uh, in the concert might be physically threatening the bass and, and so on and so forth but not necessarily that's, uh, that's the point. so here for instance you have um, uh, the installation by uh, Anish Kapoor, uh, uh, and that's a description that I borrowed uh, line uh, which uh, emphasizes the relationship uh, of this uh, work of art to the sense of the infinity. And so uh, that's a description actually of the installation. So I uh, quote the spinning black body of water fills up a 10 foot wide circle carved for the floor of the retired theater and cinema space. Something similar has been done uh, actually in one of the Nuit Blanche in Paris a few years ago, but uh, in the same. Uh, 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 you could see in the water's uh, rotation in the same that might give, give you, I mean, the, 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 the critic talks of the illusion of infinite depth as if you have you had infinite depth. In fact, of course, it's a work of art, but maybe that's enough to trigger some kind of limit experience. No. <laughs> this is uh, unfathoming, uh, so you can't actually uh, evaluate the, the, the depth of uh, what's, what's going on. Even if you may know on a reflective or intellectual level that, of course, it can't be infinite. That might be an interesting distinction uh, between uh, this kind of uh, installation, artistic installation, and you know the, the natural, uh, of, for instance, the, the, the universe or something like that. Okay, so uh, in our analysis, as I as I said, um, uh, expenses of the sublime are not primarily responses to external objects, but in fact to one's own cognitive limitation. So uh, in principle, so we don't define actually. The expense of the sublime in terms of in terms of its objects, uh, as other philosophers have done, especially in the tradition. So you have always the same kind of objects that are listed: the Alps, uh, even from Longinus, actually. So of course not, but not the Alps, but uh, uh, you know vast things: uh, the, 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 the sky, the, 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 the ocean, and so on and so forth. So across the cultures, you have the same uh, kinds of objects that are uh, described as, as sublime. But we leave open the fact that uh, maybe what uh, can trigger expenses of the sublime may vary across time, individuals, and cultures. And I think that's, that's an important uh, feature of our analysis. So let, let me end with uh, this idea of self transcendent experiences. Uh, so that's a later outcome of the project. Uh, uh, expenses of, of the sublime belong perhaps to a, a broader class of experiences uh, which uh, some psychologists have called uh, self-transcendent in the sense that uh, these are experiences involving the feeling that uh, the self-world boundaries have uh, shifted in, in some way or maybe disappeared. Uh, so for instance, the a famous example of a self-transcendent experiences which is not uh, the expense of the sublime, is, for instance, the oceanic feeling. The oceanic feeling is the feeling that, uh, you know, the boundaries between self and world have actually disappeared. So it's like ego dissolution. Uh, so you can have this experience by, 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 by uh, and some drugs can trigger these experiences, but also maybe may meditation or other outcomes. These, according to us, are not expenses of the sublime because you don't you won't necessarily have this aesthetic accommodation, which is a characteristic of experiences of the sublime, but like experiences of the sublime, they are self transcendent. The change uh, in the experience, of course, not necessarily really or ontologically speaking, but uh, in the experience, uh, the boundaries between yourself and the world uh, need to change. Naturally, that's the connection with social psychology that we are interested in as well. Uh, social so, so psychology has shown that broadly positive self-transcendent experiences and quotes are more often associated with positive outcomes such as well-being, social behavior. In the case of the expanse of the sublime, that's maybe strange because 
has negative components, which is if you reach the starting point of the experience, but then these negative evaluation is compensated by a positive evaluation by aesthetic uh, accommodation. So you could uh, actually uh, also say that um, it's an experience that is, uh, because it is self-transcendent, transcendent, uh, may be associated with uh, positive uh, out outcomes uh, such as well-being and pro-social behavior, or prone to help others, uh, for instance, uh, when you have uh, such experiences. Why so? Because self-transcendent experiences enables the subject to realize that you know the boundaries between self and world are contingent because they change, they can change uh, in the experiences. And so that, of course, puts in perspective our relationship with the world. And also they, they involve involuntary strained exercises of our perspective taking or empathetic abilities. It's very difficult to be empathetic with a sublime object because it's too strong, too powerful. Uh, but we try. Uh, and, uh, a philosopher uh, whom I quoted before, uh, Tom Cochrane, I mean, actually uh, used this idea of empathy for objects to, to uh, defend the view that um, when you experience something sublime, you, you try to empathize, you try to understand. So, you know, this strange exercise of your perspective taking or empathetic abilities can actually uh, can uh, uh, reinforce or st strengthen uh, these abilities. Also, some of them, some of these uh, experiences may involve the feeling that the world, you know, is meaningless in itself, and that comfort must come from uh, our relationship with uh, others. Okay, so that's not the experience in itself, which is important, but it's contrast with other experiences that we might we may have uh, outside the sublime. And let me just end with this, with two quotations that are, of course, from very different. Uh, historical periods. Um, so you, you have Pascal uh, in the Pensée, uh, um, 1570, if I'm not mistaken, uh, who said, all bodies, the firmament, the stars, the earth, and its kingdoms, so sublime objects actually, are not equal to the lowest mind, for mind knows all this and itself and these bodies nothing. Well-known uh, quotation by Pascal. And uh, another quotation by the uh, Cambridge philosopher Frank uh, Ramsey, 1925, uh, uh, a colleague and friend of uh, Wittgenstein in, in, in Cambridge, uh, he says something uh, very close, I think, to what Pascal uh, says. Quote, what I seem to differ from my friends is in attaching little importance to physical size. I don't feel in the least humble before the vastness of the heavens. The stars may be large, but they can't think or love. And these are qualities which impress me far more than size does. I take no credit for weighing nearly 17 stone. A picture of the world is drawn in perspective, not like a model to scale. The foreground is occupied by human beings and the stars are all as small as three hundred bits. So that's, if you wish, a plea for turning away from the stars and, uh, you know, more to uh, others. Uh, but, but still, I mean, the experiences of the sublime can play a role in realization that this is what we should do. So, of course, maybe we have first to feel humble before the vastness of the heavens and then realize that uh, other experiences of the world are possible, uh, that we, we may... Uh, uh, endorse uh, what these authors uh, say about the vastness of the, the universe. Finally, that's just, uh, just for fun if you wish to in my presentation. Uh, so existential comics are you know comics about uh, philosophical topics, important topics. Yeah, I can't read because it's too but that's uh, Burke and uh, Schopenhauer, I can not mistake, experience uh, the sublime uh, together, or maybe each uh, on its own, on, on, on his own, and uh, also in the realization that there is something else, uh, of course, that is maybe equally important, uh, friendship or 
social um, relationships. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. And again, thanks to Nicole for accepting to you know, raise uh, issues about this uh, very schematic presentation. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jérôme. Um, so I have many questions. Um, we have 15 to 30 minutes to, um, to discuss. And of course, anyone who is listening uh, online, uh, please do feel free to ask a question and I will, I will read it out uh, so that everybody can, can hear it. Um, so I thought we'd start uh, quite general and then maybe work our way into, um, into, the, um, into your, your talk um, so that we can look at later on at the more uh, nitty gritty aspects and perhaps the, I'll take up the challenge of, uh, um, of uh, your argument that the sublime um, applies to artworks um, uh, as well as uh, environment. Um, so, uh, but uh, getting back to, to some general points, I just wondered uh, first if you could say something about the roles of philosophical approaches and approaches from the cognitive sciences um, to um, just in general, I suppose, for a general kind of inquiry about, uh, about the world, um, how they can be differentiated and how they complement uh, each other. And then I suppose what's going to be interesting for our purposes here is um, how that uh, applies particularly to the concept of the sublime or uh, sublime objects as you as you talk about them. So that, that's an interdisciplinary project. I mean, in the sense that, that you know, philosophers, neuroscientists, uh, social scientists, um, uh, philosophers, you know, are all you know trying to you know identify some interesting issues and then uh, determine whether I mean these issues can at least in part uh, be addressed by you know, experimental uh, procedures or something like that. Now it's true that I introduced this notion of interdisciplinary uh, objects that um, uh, my colleague Jean Petitot I think once uh, talked about perhaps in a, in a different sense. I mean these are objects that may, uh, you know, uh, appear to be relevant uh, uh, only from a multidisciplinary perspective. Uh, so may maybe in that very psychological sense, if you wish, uh, the sublime is not an interdisciplinary object because, after all, I mean, philosophy has been uh, um, has talked about the sublime for uh, many centuries. So. Um, the philosophers alone, I mean, have discovered the, that this is an interesting object to study. Uh, but I mean, as, as you know, when philosophy was an interdisciplinary, has been an interdisciplinary um, endeavor for, for from the beginning, actually, because of course, uh, all these guys were both philosophers and psychologists and uh, physiologists as well. And uh, uh, so, um, so the sublime probably uh, is appears as, as an object uh, only from such multidisciplinary perspective. So this is what I call an interdisciplinary object. It doesn't mean that one discipline uh, uh, can't study the sublime, of course. But if if one discipline, such as I don't know, philosophical aesthetics, maybe will miss some of the subtle effects. Uh, of experiences of the sublime on self-awareness, because these are effects that are uh, show up only when uh, you adopt a certain kind of um, level of description to the, the phenomenon. I don't know. I mean, but but that's that's the that's the idea. So um, just to, to just to finish on that question, um, uh, but you you do say at the beginning of your talk that not only can it be, mm -hmm. but it must be. So must is quite strong. There seems a, there's a strong sense of obligation there to the idea that uh, sublime objects or the sublime have to, you know, there's there's an emergent, well, not an emergency, but an urgency to ensuring that we provide a cognitive scientific explanation for the sublime. I, I take the point here. Yeah, I mean, probably, I mean, 
a genuine interdisciplinary object will be an object that is invisible from a single perspective, from a single discipline, for instance, which might not be the case, at least with the sublime. Okay. So, uh, so if must is too strong, uh, of course, you can still say it's best accounted for uh, in terms of a multi. Because I think there are several levels of explanation. And, uh, and I should say that I, I you know, I, um, I think that this um, cooperation between disciplines is not, is not, uh, should not be uh, taken in a, in a kind of reductionist way. I mean, like you know, neuroesthetics uh, thought that uh, um, everything can be explained at the level of, of brain uh, processes and functions. So, so. So I think Semir Zeki, or maybe Ramachandran, I don't know. So, 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 if you, if you, so, somewhere, I mean, says that if you don't take into account the brain, you don't understand what an aesthetic experience is. Which means that, which means that before neurosciences, in neuroscience were uh, uh, existed at all. I mean, we we could not talk about aesthetic experiences because we didn't know about the relevant brain processes. That, that seems to me to be strong, too strong. But, but, but now that we have neuroscience, there are interesting results that I think shape, I mean, reshape uh, 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 our conception, the philosophical conception of the, the sublime. Mm -hmm. But I actually developed that uh, more, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. Certainly, I don't want to, to to be understood in a kind of reductionist way, as if cognitive science would, uh, you know, uh, would have all the, the keys to understand what is going on. I don't think so, actually. I think that really we need cooperation between uh, social, uh, social, social sciences and uh, cognitive sciences, and and maybe the, the the philosophers can do part of the negotiation between these uh, very different uh, fields of inquiry. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So um, uh, we have uh, we have uh, a question from the audience. So um, our questioner says, uh, "Thank you very much for your talk. Do you see any tension between individuating sublime objects or experiences as sublime and the feature of framelessness? Are these objects experienced outside any frame whatsoever, or any uh, mental schemas or scripts?" Thank you. No, that, that's that's an interesting question. Actually, the way you use frame in the, the last uh, sentence is interesting because maybe maybe you have in mind cognitive frames, and and, and, and maybe the sublime is uh, frameless in the sense of being uh, formless or limitless, uh, unlike the beautiful, maybe according to the tradition at least, uh, but also in the sense that. Uh, it um, you know exceeds our cognitive frames, so it overwhelms our mind in the sense that we don't uh, our cognitive frames are not enough to uh, you know uh, understand what is going on when we experience the experiencing the sublime. Uh, so the, so that's the, that was my my answer to the second part of your uh, question. The first part, do you see any tension between individuating sublime objects or experiences and the feature of framelessness? Uh, so framelessness is, is a, a concept I borrowed from, uh, I mean, you can find it in Burke or maybe Kant, of course, but uh, I think Emily Brady uses this concept to characterize sublime objects in contrast to, uh, you know, beautiful objects which are, uh, which have a form, uh, which are contained uh, in some sense uh, like uh, like sublime objects um, so well in relation to uh, to that to that distinction between uh, beauty and uh, the sublime I wondered if you could say a little bit more um, about the distinction and how that is meaningful for for cognition, say, um, since it seems, you know, you come to the conclusion that um, that the experience of the sublime uh, has as a, uh, a repercussion on our cognitive um, on our cognitive abilities the um, uh, the sort of the, the recognition of uh, our own limits 
Um, and uh, anyway, so it, it seems like uh, it seems like there is this distinction. Perhaps there are those who argue that there isn't such a distinction between mm -hmm. the beautiful and, and the sublime. Where, where do you stand on uh, on the issue? Well, of course, I mean, that's also an important uh, question because uh, so w when we started with the experimental uh, procedures, we, we had a linguistic problem because the sublime in English, but also in French, I think, might mean uh, most beautiful, or very beautiful or something like that. C'est sublime, this is sublime. Uh, so uh, many people who actually use uh, the term sublime uh, may use it in a, in, a, in a different meaning, in a different sense uh, from, from, you know, the on this relatively technical notion of sublimity in, in philosophy. Uh, so that was one of our problems when we designed uh, questionnaires to, to ask people about their experiences in various circumstances, with respect to music, for instance. So we actually decided to avoid uh, using uh, the notion, the, the word sublime in our question, questionnaire, insisting uh, uh, on, on, you know, uh, some of the core features uh, have uh, presented, so whether the music is overwhelming, whether it involves mixed emotions, for instance, mixed feelings, whether there is a negative component to the experience or something like that. Uh, but, but that's an issue. And we are not all in agreement in the project, within projects about the, the relationship between uh, beauty and the sublime. And some of us think that the sublime is, you know, um, uh, the, the most extreme value of the beautiful ones. Uh, so there can be things that are more or less beautiful, or you can compare things uh, with respect to their beauty. You can say this is more beautiful than, than this, but you can't say this is more sublime than this. Because sublimity is not a gradual uh, concept, but it's something which is uh, you know, either sublime or, or not sublime. But that can be like explained on the, on the hypothesis that you have uh, sublimity as a kind of most extreme value of the beautiful. I'm not sure I buy this. Uh, I, I want to, to draw a distinction between uh, beauty and sublimity, uh, more essential or categorical distinction. Um, so I have to find other criteria. And maybe uh, emotional complexity might be one of these criteria because there are experiences of the beauty that are you know, homogeneous, uh, which are wholly positive, wholly pleasant, wholly, uh, you know, fully uh, pleasurable or something like that. Whereas uh, in the case of the sublime, I mean, the experience should, should have this negative component that we uh, associate with the limit experience. Now, what complicates the picture, as you, as you know, because you, you work on, on this, uh, you also have experiences of beauty, um, with some negative components. So what's called in the literature uh, a terrible beauty, for instance, when you have uh, negative emotions uh, or disgust, for instance, might actually um, uh, be compatible with a, a positive experience of beauty. You might, even if, you, if some aspects of uh, a work of art uh, are, are disgusting, you might still have a, an experience of beauty, which which also is a mixed feeling because, of course, you have disgust, but, but a positive aesthetic evaluation uh, eventually. So, um, so not not any, not all uh, emotionally complex aesthetic experiences are about the sublime. Some are, are still about beauty, but in a different sense. I mean, terrible beauty or difficult beauty, as uh, Bosanke used uh, to say. So that's one of our problems. I mean, to to this to them demarcate uh, the sublime from, uh, from the beauty in a, in, a, in, a, yeah, in a way which is acceptable from a philosophical point of view. That's, that's an important point. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have a, another question from, um, from someone online. Uh, so I'll read their question. Uh, thank you for such an interesting talk. I'm Roberto, Lara, I hope I get this right, Laraniega a PhD researcher at the European University Institute. I have a couple of questions, he says. In a book uh, by John Jurassity, I read that there is a, a nexus between melancholy and the sublime. Mm 
That is, that melancholic persons are more prone to contemplate the sublime. Do you have any thoughts on that? Do you want to start with that part? No, and then that, I'll... That, and I don't know about this book, but that's an interesting way. I will check it, of course. Thanks for, for this uh, reference. Um, so when I presented some, some, um, some of the things to uh, La Salpetria, for instance, to colleagues from psychiatry. psychiatry. Uh, so they, they told me that there are some, some interesting uh, uh, affinities between um, uh, what, what we call a limit, radical limit experience here and, uh, you know, uh, uh, what's called pro Dromo psychosis, I mean, the first stages of psychosis when, when people feel derealized and uh, they feel uh, small or it's not melancholy, of course, but I mean, it's connected to some conditions that are well known to uh, psychologists, psychoanalysts, maybe a psych psychiatrist. So that's, that's a very interesting way to, to go. I don't know about the connection to melancholy. That's a, an interesting uh, uh, idea. Of course, I mean, uh, of course, it's not obvious, but uh, if, if there is something like aesthetic accommodation that is supposed to compensate for these negative emotions uh, that you, you are filled with when you uh, are confronted with the sublime, uh, the, the melancholy should, in a sense, disappear, uh, so or, or be attenuated or modified by this later stage of uh, the experience of the sublime. So melancholy should be associated with maybe the limit experience that according to us, you know, starts um, or, or you know, um, is the first uh, stage of the or moment of the, of the experience of the sublime. Anyway, that, that's an interesting, uh, uh, interesting uh, question. Um, okay, so Robert, uh, Roberto has two other questions. So the next one is, um, what does the sublime with small-scaled objects such as bonsais, moss, Japanese dead gardens, etc., say about such experiences? Yes. So, I mean, perhaps one of, of Burke's uh, and Moon Burke's uh, mistakes is to it tends to associate the sublime with uh, small objects. Uh, so the sublime are, it, it talks about microscopic objects at some points, uh, saying that if you have something infinite in the other dimension as well, in the other direction of the spatial dimension, for instance, that can be sublime as well. But when you see these examples, but also Kant's examples, uh, Kant examples of the beautiful are very often flowers, you know, uh, mm -hmm. tulips or something like that. Uh, so small scaled object, as you say, um, but that's a mistake. That's why that, we think that small object, maybe ordinary objects, uh, everyday objects, why not? I mean, could trigger the an expense of the sublime. Uh, in the project, we defend the, the idea that expenses of the beautiful and expense of the sublime are exclusive of each other. I mean, you, you can't have both at the same time. Okay, so something can't feel beautiful and sublime at the, at the same time. But since we don't define uh, these experiences in terms of their objects, uh, it, it's possible that the same object can be, you know, felt as sublime in, in one context and felt as beautiful in another context, even by the same individual, uh, not at the same time, of course. Uh, if there is an exclusion between the experiences, it doesn't follow that there is an ex exclusion at the ontological level, at the level of the objects of the uh, experiences. So we leave open the possibility that uh, you know, Japanese Zen gardens, perhaps because they have to do with uh, order, with the perfection. So perfection can, can, I mean, of course, not, not objective perfection, but I mean, the experience of per perfection can be associated with, the, with, with beauty because, of course, uh, perfection is beautiful, uh, order uh, is beautiful, um, harmonious, uh, and so on and so forth. But perfect, the experience of perfection can also be associated with the sublime as well, because, for instance, uh, 
you can have a sort of platonic experience of perfection as something that you can't attain. You, you can't actually uh, be yourself perfect. So this uh, you know, gap between uh, your uh, experience of perfection and what uh, yourself you can achieve as a fin finite human being, that can be the source of a sublime experience as well. So you see, the same thing might, in some circumstances, depending on your state of mind, uh, give rise to an experience of the sublime, but and in another context, an experience of the beautiful. So yes, why not? Um, okay, and the final question that um, Roberto asks is, uh, what about the history of the sublime? Have such experiences been granted more importance in certain historical contexts, such as the Romantic uh, era? Mm -hmm. uh, have other times been rather keen on beauty, or is this too simplistic? Yes, so I'm not a historian, but of course that, that's also an important uh, issue, because you might say, some people have said that, you know, it's, uh, it's not interesting to work on the sublime because it's, it's, a, it's a historical topos. I mean, it's associated with uh, the Romantic uh, era, for instance, and uh, uh, nowadays, of course, you have uh, the sublime is now by uh, the American painter. Um, uh, the name escapes me. Uh, me too, actually. Uh, <laughs> uh, and you have, you know, this work in France by, by Lyotard, for instance, on uh, contemporary art. Uh, but again, I mean. Since we don't define uh, experiences of the sublime in terms of the object, we don't start with the object, uh, but we, we start with the state of mind, the limit experience that we can have in some uh, circumstances. I think we have more freedom to, um, to say that um, what is experienced as sublime uh, in, in such and such uh, social, cultural context may not be experienced as such in another social cultural context. So, you know, that, that can vary, I think. What, what is interesting is, of course, that I, I think Emily Brady makes this observation that um, the examples uh, of beautiful objects have considerably varied uh, across time, I mean, across mm -hmm. history. Uh, so, of course, the, the, the Greek uh, canons of beauty are not the same as uh, our canons of beauty and, and so on and so forth. Whereas the examples of sublime objects uh, are about quite the same. I mean, it's also, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, the sky, uh, the, the, the ocean, uh, the, the a raging storm, uh, uh, maybe the pyramids, uh, and so on and so forth, the Alps. Uh, so that, that's an interesting, you know, historical point that uh, there is more stability in the uh, in the list of objects described as sublime in the history of um, you know, uh, in human history. So that, that's interesting as well. It does not necessarily contradict what I, I've said before, that we don't start with the objects, uh, but that's something that should be taken out. So I'm, I'm just going to piggyback off, of, of, course, of, off of that question and, and your answer, um, just for, uh, just maybe to explain um, this, this resurgence of interest in the sublime that we have now. So it seems in the last few years, it's uh, come into vogue. Um, and uh, I, I wondered if, if you had an explanation for why that's the case. Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, well, as you know, I mean, you're, you're of course, uh, better placed uh, than me to, to, to make this assessment, but it, it seems to me that environmental uh, considerations have become, for obvious reasons, more important uh, to us uh, for, for, for the last uh, decades, I guess, or something like that. So we're more interested in our experiences of nature and uh, how to maybe preserve uh, nature in some sense. So uh, maybe through that door, if I can say so, uh, interest in the sublime it, it, uh, it has revived. What do you think? I mean, that, that might be one explanation. Um, 
Well, as you were saying that, it it seems to me that uh, the the negation of self awareness or self negation yes, yes. Uh, seems to play a role in uh, in our concerns for uh, for for the environment. Um, but I suppose it's it, it might also be uh, a helpful concept or helpful tool to help us uh, under to to make more explicit or um, uh, bring into focus uh, things to do with 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 our mental states, uh, and and how um, how can we uh, how can we make sense of our mental states given perhaps uh, a, a feeling of, um, of of being limited in our capacity to act <laughs> to 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 change a given set of circumstances. Maybe some people would say that it comes from uh, a technological point of view because there is this idea of the technological sublime that's mm -hmm. come into yep. into uh, that's 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 come into the the, the discourse. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the idea that uh, you know when we're <laughs> when we're engaged with our uh, with our various devices, we enter into this world that is uh, beyond us in some respect. I don't know. But that's an interesting question because, of course, in France, you have this, there has been this shift from, you know, um, claiming that nature is the primary source of the sublime to the claim, to the Hegelian claim that uh, it's actually uh, art and contemporary art in particular that, uh, that should be the primary source of the sublime. Mm -hmm. It's art that is sublime and not, not primarily nature. Mm -hmm. But, but then now we come back to the, the traditional idea that nature or in the environment more generally uh, is the primary source of our sublime experiences. And that tells, us, that tells something important probably mm -hmm. about our relationship to nature, artifacts, mm -hmm. uh, and so on and so forth. Maybe we're going through some kind of transformative period. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that's, yeah, perhaps. Um, I, there's there's another question from uh, from the floor, and then maybe we can come back to this idea of of art and and the environment. Um, so, uh, whoever says whoever this is says hi. Thank you for this fascinating presentation. I experienced a recognition of several experiences I I had experiences I had in contexts of complexity in which limits are encountered. In particular how people each perceive limits rather differently, and in my experience, react uh, very differently. My question in this context is, how would you approach the, the study of complexity, limits, and their perception in a possibly non-aesthetic context? So thank you for this uh, question. So in the paper I quoted uh, with Nagarita Kanjeli, actually we, we try to define the notion of limit experience in general. I mean, and not necessarily in an aesthetic or artistic context. So we, we try to give an account of what it means to experience the limits of... Uh, so again, I mean, a very, you know, uh, simple example is auditory perception when you hear the notes that... Uh, I mean, you're, you're trying to, to hear the very last, uh, the highest notes that you're able to uh, discern. Uh, it's, I, 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 to strain your auditory capacities, you know, to, to grasp the very last one. And, and this is a limit experience, but of course it's, it's not necessarily an aesthetic experience. As you know, aesthetic might, might you know, be almost synonymous with perception. But for in, in that sense, of course, since it, it involves uh, auditory perception, it's, it's aesthetic. But it's not aesthetic in the sense that you make an aesthetic judgment, for instance, on evaluation of what you're hearing, you might do such an evaluation that you need the two. Uh, so so that, that's, but, but we say it's, it's a, it's a non-radical um, limit experience. So we make this distinction between ordinary uh, limit experiences and radical limit experiences. Um, but even within the class of radical limit experiences, I don't think uh, that all limit experiences are aesthetic, for instance. So, so for instance, uh, the oceanic feeling might, is a limit experience because I mean, you, you, experience, you experience the world as uh, you know uh, yourself and yourself and the world are one or something like that. So that, that's, that's also a limit experience in the sense in which um, 
in fact, um, uh, you have, uh, so for instance, what the uh, Wuzil calls the other condition is, is, is a state of mind in which you seem to understand, you seem to grasp the meaning of everything that you uh, experience, okay, the world, others, and so on and so forth. Love can, can be perhaps another example of, of such a condition. Uh, you seem to understand the other or nature um, from the inside. So that's also a limited experience. So if you, you experience, you know, the but a limit experience which goes in the other direction because here you you experience the you know the the limit less of your own cognitive capacities to, to deal with the world. You, you seem to understand uh, the world from, from the inside. It's a way of knowing the world from the inside, says uh, Muzil, for instance. It's not necessarily an aesthetic uh, experience, but you're right. I mean, uh, our use of the notion of limit experience is not restricted to the aesthetic uh, domain. That's, of course, it's very, it's, it's very important. I have to say, I, you know, I'm not, as I said at the beginning, uh, I was interested in the project because I saw the sublime as an opportunity to, you know, to test various ideas from philosophy of perception, from philosophy of mind, uh, which, which, you know, are not especially connected to aesthetics. So that was one of my motivation to, uh, to, 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 you know, to try to, to deal with that aesthetic objects, they may be sublime. I'd like to, to come back to um, uh, the idea of, uh, I mean, all of these things are interconnected, of course, but uh, uh, you and Margarita seem to um, focus on the, the cognitive incommensurability. Mm -hmm. And I sort of wondered about that because uh, it's, it seems to me that the, the, that there is also a perceptual mm -hmm. incommensurability. So I wondered if you, if you could say something about maybe the, the distinction, if you think there is one between the two, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and why you focus in particular on the cognitive dimension rather mm -hmm. than the perceptual. So maybe, of course, the, the word cognitive, uh, you know that, but. Uh, the word cognitive can be used, uh, you know, in, in a wide sense, uh, it includes perception actually. So I, I used the notion of cognitive incommensurability as um, an incommensurability that concerns perception, but also everything else in the experience, of course, because in a sense, if you wish, when you have, you have accommodated, uh, when you have the sublime experience as an aesthetic experience, in a sense, you reevaluate your limit experience as, as being a kind of illusion because it seemed to, to you that you couldn't cope with the world. I mean, that, that's your experience, but, but then you, you know better and you draw on resources that you, unsuspected resources, I mean, so, uh, novel resources maybe, uh, and then you reevaluate your limit experiences, your limit experience, I mean, the, the, the starting point of your. Experience of the sublime. So yes, I would say there is perceptual incommensurability. There is uh, imagination. Is all is, uh, actually Kant is, is quite clear about that. I mean, uh, he doesn't use the words, the phrase "limit experience," but his idea is that uh, the sublime, you know, overwhelms perception, overwhelms imagination. But McGree's, and we agree with that, except that we we add ordinary thinking as well. I mean, so sublime overwhelms perception, overwhelms imagination, and overwhelms ordinary thinking, ordinary thought. Uh, I mean, our spontaneous categories, the spontaneous categories that we use to uh, uh, to, to describe or to understand uh, what is going on. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's only with mental efforts that we can uh, overcome these limitations and uh, find a way to uh, you know, think about uh, what is going on. Mm -hmm. Um, now, when you have cognitive in, incommensurability, uh, do, do you always have, for instance, perceptual uh, incommensurability? That's a good question, uh, because for us, at least for me, I don't want to, maybe Margaret will disagree with that, but I, I, I think that um, 
uh, we can apply the notion of sublimity to, uh, to art, not only to nature, because what is at stake is cognitive incommensurability rather than just physical uh, incommensurability. Uh, but the extent to which you can have one without the other, I mean, the cognitive vulnerability without any physical vulnerability, uh, of course, if you have cognitive vulnerability, uh, you, you also feel physically vulnerable because, uh, of course, we are embodied. So if I feel, uh, so for instance, um, an epistemologist, British epistemologist called uh, Duncan Pritchard, I mean, co talks of epistemic angst, I mean, an epistemic fear when you are confronted with your skeptic uh, arguments or uh, uh, or the, the, the Cartesian demon or something like that. I mean, that's you, you, you experience something that is close to derealization. I mean, you, so I, I, I thought there was an external world, and now there is this skeptic uh, argument, skeptical argument that tells me that maybe this world does not exist. So that's epistemic angst. I mean, you, it's a kind of vertigo, if you wish, that you experience because uh, there's a void, uh, there seems to be a void where you, you thought there was your ordinary world. And of course, I mean, that has uh, repercussions on your physical state, of course, vertigo is a physical state. So you, you can't really separate um, cognitive from physical incommensurability, but I think you can start with co cognitive incommensurability in music, for instance. Uh, there are too many voices or you know, orchestral density that you can't really uh, uh, you uh, can't individuate the, the, the separate the voices from each other uh, so you have an overwhelming experience which is not necessarily physically vulnerable but which um, puts in question i mean your uh, your ways of understanding what uh, what's what's going on in music uh, so that's why we insist on cognitive rather than just physical vulnerability. So, um, so in, in the context of art, so maybe, maybe one of the reasons we might, uh, we might be skeptical that the sublime in, in, in the, the Kantian conception or in this kind of conception of it, um, you know, rather than the Longinian. So, you know, Longinus, when he, when he talks about sub, the sublimity of rhetoric, for example, you know, there's a kind of extreme yeah. beauty uh, that goes along with um, with words being uttered a particular way, um, uh, but if if we if we stick to really this this uh, this idea of of the sublime being somehow uh, well, you use the words you know the vastness, the overwhelmingness, um, uh, the emotional complexity, and um, and all of of those things that that seem to come from forces that we can't perceptually order or necessarily even cognitively order. Um, perhaps there's a, a reason why we want that to be a kind of rare experience, that it's not a term that can be applied to just anything that's out there in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not uh, bonsai plants, or maybe we don't want to apply it to um, uh, to artworks, although you know, I, there are, I might I, I might accept that some artworks can be sublime in 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 that context. Maybe Anish Kapoor is one of those artworks that that I mean I can see I can I can I get it. Um, yeah, you have a slightly different view from uh, Emily's about that. I yes, think. yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so there is. I mean, I don't want to speak for for Emily, but um, yes, the, the, I think she's got a stronger view. That really it needs, but but maybe she's right though because um, the the because uh, because of the rarity of the experience and the the sort of intensity that can go along with it those mixed emotions that um, you know that transcendence that one one might feel we 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 just don't want everything to be sublime mm -hmm. it provides that nice contrast to the ordinary everyday world where we see bonsais and trees and flowers and beautiful things that bring us, uh, bring us, uh, I don't know, solace or consolation or joy or whatever, whatever that might be. Well, I see the tension. I mean, I, I, I want to, and I want to, to have a balanced uh, stance on this because uh, 
of course, I mean, an extreme view would be that any object whatsoever, I mean, can be experienced as sublime, given the right frame of mind, for instance. Right. Uh, and um, so, of course, I mean, Japanese gardens might, you might say, you have a sense of perfection or order, or everything is in its place. And, uh, and this might give rise to traditionally to uh, an experience of beauty rather than an experience of the sublime, because sublime has to do with the disorder, with uh, complexity rather than simplicity. Uh, so you might say we are on the, the beauty side of the, the aesthetic uh, values. But at the same time, you might say, but, but then what, what is this perfection that I seem to experience? I mean, does it really exist or is it an idea? Uh, is it an ideal that I can actually, because I'm an imperfect, I'm imperfect myself, cognitively speaking, physically, physically speaking, and maybe you can come to experience the same object as perhaps not being sublime, but you know, close to something that we want to call the sublime. I don't know, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I agree with you. I, I don't want to to claim that any object whatsoever can be experienced as sublime. Um, mm -hmm. That seems too strong uh, to me. So yeah, mm. and also be of course that, that nature, uh, as it happens, I mean, uh, is 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 still uh, statistically at least um, an important source of uh, sublime experiences, mm -hmm. sublimity experiences. Well, there might be just one uh, other um, approach to 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 the question, another skeptical question about artworks being being sublime, and and that is to say that. Uh, with with artworks, um, it seems that even with uh, those rare art, uh, objects that that, that, might, that are pushing it, right? Mm -hmm. um, environmental works, uh, Anish Kapoor, um, the the example. Mm -hmm. You know, we might as well just use that example because uh, it's here. So it it seems like. Um, there, there's some kind of dissolution that can go on. You know, you can you 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 can feel the angst mm -hmm. that's uh, that's associated with them. But still, and even even if they're not framed, as in a painting mm -hmm. is framed, as in the the, the Friedrich uh, paintings, um, there's there's still in some sense circumscribed. I mean, it's you know. Those are those are uh, limit. Maybe I can call them limit objects. You know, um, they they still it it still seems like we can have some kind of cognitive handle there in a way that we just might not when we think about uh, the chaos of the universe or something. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, 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 I um, it's a fair question. So. Um... In a sense, I mean, Anish Kapoor installation is framed because, of course, you go in a theater or in a cinema, yeah, in a closed, uh, you know, uh, room in which you have this installation. So it's, it's framed in that sense. I mean, there's a distinction between being uh, inside and outside the work of art, for instance. If you're inside, I mean, somebody will will will, will uh, grasp. But you might also say that it is frameless uh, in at least one respect, which is the experienced uh, depth of the, that you seem to see, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but I agree, I agree that that might be a, a relevant contrast with, uh, you know, uh, natural examples of the sublime, of course, mm -hmm. natural, uh, and and uh, we, we have to talk more about that, about the, the differences, which I agree exist. Um, so, I have. I, I actually have another question. So I, I hope I can just ask it, and then I'll, and then I'll, and then I'll, and then I'll stop uh, sure. because the conversation is uh, interesting. Um, so there's there's another there's another uh, aspect about uh, the experience of the sublime. So uh, when it comes to uh, um, not just uh, the idea of so you've got this step of self-negation, you know, that you had in your nice uh, schema there on the on the on the PowerPoint presentation. So we have this um, self-negation or the suppression of self-awareness, this kind of metacognitive awareness that something is going on and we can't um, we can't control it or we can't uh, 
um, uh, we can't control what seem to be external forces that are that are that are chaotic. Uh, nevertheless, um, if we if we go back to Kant for a moment, uh, he he does say something more than uh, just linking the sublime to a kind of social dimension. Mm -hmm. um, he says, well, we recognize ourselves as subjects and as reasoning subjects. So mm -hmm. you talked about understanding and you talked about, um, so we recognize ourselves as subjects and we recognize ourselves as actually in ordinary day-to-day -day life, being able to make moral choices. Mm -hmm. That is to say that that destruction that can happen out there in the world uh, is, um, is something that I can, you know, the, it, it might kind of metaphorically or in some way relate to the anger that I might feel inside um, and, the, and the, 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 the reasoning about moral choices that I have in relation to that anger, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's it's linked to our subjectivities and our status as moral beings. And I just I just wondered if you if you had anything you wanted to say to that. No, of course, but that's that that's that's a, that's a deep question. So I, I can't really answer it now because we're coming to, to an end. You just said that the 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 the, the, the you know the the Componential analysis that we that we give is a schematic in a good sense. I mean, because it's compatible with uh, several uh, ways of understanding each of the components. Actually, especially the last last one, because the last component, which is aesthetic accommodation, is the one that we have uh, less studied in the project because we were interested, in, in fact, in uh, self awareness and you know implications of. Uh, experiences of the sublime to one's own self-awareness. I mean, the, the way we experience ourselves being small or smaller, or perhaps even uh, uh, inexistent or out of the world. Uh, so you're right that we have to study now more uh, aesthetic accommodation and to, right. to try to understand what, what I mean. The Kantian uh, account of aesthetic accommodation, uh, which is, insists on the, the idea of a moral subject, uh, even if you're not Kantian, I mean, it might be an, an interesting way to go. And, um, but perhaps there, there are other, you know, more uh, mundane or more le less substantial, maybe, or more deflationary accounts of. Uh, of what we call aesthetic accommodation. I think we, we think it's a virtue of our model that it is schematic in this sense. I mean, that you can plug in uh, different accounts of uh, what it means to accommodate once you have these vivid experiences. Mm -hmm. Maybe the idea of a moral subject will, will come up at, at that stage, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an interesting... Uh, so I can't really answer you, but I mean, yes, mm -hmm. I would say that more work is needed uh, in that respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it might link to, um, uh, to uh, it can be used as a useful contrast, I think, to, to uh, better understanding well-being. <laughs> yes, yes. But yeah, I, which I, is, I, which I is see, a, a nice... I see the connection to, yeah. to the well-being. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Jérôme. Uh, Thanks to well, you. Thanks to the audience.